Uh, today is Science Fiction and Research, a discussion with experts. And this is going to be, uh, me and Liliana will talk about uh, some subjects um, alternately, and you can decide who is who in that picture. And <laughs> the uh, introduction for this uh, I've adapted from my, my favourite uh, story uh, which physics lecturers used to tell, and they would often tell the, the 1845 story about William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, the legendary thermodynamicist and Cavendish physicist, who um, in 1845, was, he was a clever chap, and was convinced he was a shoo-in for the, uh, the position of senior wrangler, or first place in the Cambridge Mathematics Tripos. And so, so confident was he that he'd come top, he decided to simply send his friend to the Senate House to listen to the results, and gave his friend the instructions. Hmm, come back and tell me who came second in the mathematics tripos. And Julia's friend went off, and returned a bit later, chortling to himself, and informed uh, Lord Kelvin, you did, William. <laughs> he'd come second. So, by analogy to that, uh, in the setup for this talk, I thought it would be nice to talk about science fiction um, and research, and so I duly sent off my PhD student with the instruction, find me someone else that I'd like to do a discussion about some things. So, go and, can you go and find out who in the department knows that is the academic who knows the second most about science fiction? And my son and my PhD student uh, trundled off and came back in the fullness of time and said, uh, you are, Eric. <laughs> Um, so it turns out that Liliana knows more about science fiction than me, and the evidence for this um, is that she's got a, a, a Star Trek original series um, poster on her wall and various other sci-fi memorabilia. And my PhD student had observed this information, and I can, all I can say is that I trained him far too well in logical reasoning and not nearly well enough in diplomacy and tact. <laughs> and so asked who's the second best in science fiction, he replied, you are, Eric. Now, so that's the, the introduction, and so we put together um, a list of a few things uh, to talk about. Oh, Liliana also has a, uh, a published paper on science fiction in nanotechnology. Yes, imagine that. It's a peer-reviewed paper on nanotechnology in science fiction. In the Lotus Effect, yes. the German Studies Review. Or yes. Something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an obscure journal read by a handful of people, but nevertheless, it's a peer review paper on influence of nanotechnology on German science fiction. So if you want something obscure, this is it. And just to add to Eric that I am probably very good in disguising my ignorance about science fiction. So I appear I know so much, you know, so I have all the things and, you know, I dress appropriately today. So this is Nikola Tesla on my shirt, who inspired very many discussions and very many science fiction stories as well with his inventions. So just to add to Eric, we actually originally set out to talk about many things. But when we were preparing our talk for today, or something that we call more discussion with you as well, we realized that we'll probably need to split this event in many different parts. So we will continue doing different topics throughout the year as well. And we will start with some overview and then at the end we will give you an idea about what we are going to talk in the future as well. Um, and before we do that, uh, let me give some definitions of science fiction. So from the big three of the golden age of science fiction, um, let's say Isaac Asimov says, uh, science fiction can be defined as that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology. Um, so Robert Heinlein, the dean of science fiction, is a bit more specific. He says science fiction could be described as a realistic speculation about possible future events based solidly on adequate knowledge <coughs> of the real world, past and present, and on a thorough understanding of the nature and significance of the scientific method. At his definition, um, Arthur C. Clarke, has something a bit more free form. Um, science fiction is something that could happen, but you usually wouldn't want it to. Fantasy is something that couldn't happen, but you wish often that it could. So those are some definitions to work from, and so we can abstract from that uh, the meaning of science fiction so that we can check uh, whether what we're talking about uh, is, is within the definition of what we're talking about. Okay, so I've started with that definition, and uh, before we talk about some specific subjects that we've come across, um, we've got, um, as a, a feature for you, um, our top five lists 
of or top five lists of some recommended science fiction uh, that we think that you should read. Um, so I think the first You're slide on this right. is from uh, Liliana. <laughs> Okay, so we thought we will start with this, you know, as an introduction of which books we liked or which books maybe influenced us or has, have driven us into the science fiction. So this was a, I only, I've chosen only books. Eric has some movies as well because I couldn't decide on the five books and if I just put the movies, if I uh, put the movies and series in addition, it would be a terrible thing. So this is my personal choice. And, uh, you know, the order could, of course, change. And Rendezvous with Rama, which is written by Arthur Clarke, which I think Arthur Clarke in many ways introduced me personally to science fiction because in my small library in the small town in northern Croatia, we had a whole collection of Arthur Clarke. So this is how I started reading it as well. And, uh, of course, I liked his short stories. But Rendezvous with Rama impressed me because of the whole concept of alien technology and the spaceship uh, suddenly appearing in the solar system. And it, it appears to be uninhabited, so it was sent to us. And the group of scientists taking the scientific methodology to explore something which is so terribly different than anything we know. So it's application of scientific tools to investigate something which is unknown. And this is exactly what we scientists also do, if you look at this. It's just here is something which is more grand. Rendezvous with Rama continues. Uh, it has few books that are following up, and you learn about who's inhabiting the ships. And it goes more into the sociological study of what would happen if humans went into the ship and then traveled into the faraway galaxy. How would they create? a new sociological order, you know, within uh, uh, an alien ship. So it's an interesting book. Foundation, I will not talk so much about this. We'll probably dedicate a whole session to Isaac Asimov in the future. But it's basically Isaac Asimov is considered as one of the fathers of modern science fiction. So he wrote this in 1952. And it introduces several totally mind-boggling new concepts like mathematical sociology or prediction of future based on mathematical models, which is kind of quite interesting. And design of this foundation, which should be in charge of uh, taking care of human survival if humans disappear, and he predicts they will. It's a very interesting story. Ender's Game. I actually like the follow-up books a little bit more. So there are other books that follow on to the Ender's Game. It uh, describes the attack of alien species, bug-like alien species, intelligence on Earth, and what would happen. We destroy, in this book, humans destroy the alien species, and the main character goes on to redeeming himself because it's, he feels terrible. It's Starship Troopers with a modified yes. plot, I think. Yes, yes. Um, but the follow-up, exactly. So the follow-up books are extremely interesting because they describe a mind-boggling ecology. So they describe the world in which they are limited. Um, you know how we, we talk about diversity of, human spe of, of species on Earth? Well, on this world, you have only four or five species. And the whole ecology is described in a really interesting way. So I definitely recommend it. Revelation Space and Hyperion are more space operas that describe alien species. One civilization disappeared. Uh, scientists try to discover why travel all over the space to really come to an amazing ending. So if you want to read something which is breathtaking, at the end is Revelation Space. And then Hyperion, which is a space saga, which has new worlds, new creatures, s few characters in the quest of finding the real truth behind the whole universe and life. So this is you know, a grandiose book. Um, and as I said, there are also some other books which I like, which are uh, at the back. So yes, if you read them, if you would like to talk about them, then please let's talk afterwards. But this is my humble choice. Oh, thanks very much. I haven't read the last two, so um, I will have to add them to my list. Um, but there, there, there is a stack which is on its way from Amazon, which I've got to read. Um, and some of it is to do with probability theory, so that's going to take a long time. 
Um, probably. Uh, so, thanks. So, so, my, so my, my top five science fiction, I've cheated, um, <laughs> and I've decided um, I'll give a list. Uh, this is my set of five um, science fiction, which I think um, covers as much of the range of the genre as I can, um, whilst showing the best possible quality. And, uh, well, the big cheat is that I've put in at number one, I've put Plato's Republic. I'll come back to that, and I will do a, a quick explanation of why I think that is a science fiction book and fits perfectly inside the scope as, de as defined at the start. Um, uh, so the, the other four on the list, um, uh, Herbert West Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft is a hilarious horror serial story, a set of short stories about um, a couple of medical students, one the narrator and uh, also the eponymous uh, brilliant but amoral Herbert West who is obsessed with inventing a chemical compound uh, which he can inject into dead bodies to restore them to life. And um, they go on some adventures where they, first of all, p develop the compound and then get into worse and worse trouble as they discover that in order for it to work properly, they have to inject it into very fresh dead bodies. And therefore, uh, they, they, they do progressively more extreme things in order to obtain the dead bodies. And then they always get into trouble when they, when they uh, produce the reanimation. But they always think, well, we wouldn't have got into trouble if only we'd had a fresher dead body. <laughs> so uh, eventually they end up as, uh, as uh, surgeons in World War I, uh, where they are luckily blown up by a shell <laughs> before they manage to cause too much trouble. Um, so what else have I got on this? Uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer is um, an important book on the merging of machine and man. So if we have uh, research about uh, fitting cybernetic parts to people, and uh, even more so if we have um, the idea of the virtual world and the mind-machine interface, so that you don't look at your smartphone screen, you have, it, you have the information that's directly connected to the mind, um, then those ideas are talked about in Neuromancer. Um, I put in Aliens uh, because it has all the best technology and some good action adventure. And I put in um, 2001, um, a Space Odyssey, because uh, I had to cover a bit more of transhumanism, uh, so something from the Golden Age, um, as well as Alien Relics. So, so m more, something a bit more, something a bit more uh, plausible, maybe, than Aliens. Okay, so that, that's my list. So I'll come back to you. So Plato's Republic, um, I argue, is science fiction. It just happens to have been written 2,400 years before um, the term science fiction came into coinage. So what did we have? So we had um, science fiction, um, speculation about possible future events based on adequate knowledge of the real world, past and present, and on a, a thorough understanding of nature and the scientific method, says Robert A. Heinlein. And so Plato's Republic, I would argue, is actually quite, it somewhat resembles Logan's Run um, in that it's a story about a, mm. a city that has been strangely altered um, not so much by um, machinery and technology, uh, but rather in Plato's Republic. Um, it's actually, it's a book on ethics. So the question is, how should we live or how should the ideal city be organized? And so he duly, um, because, it's a, um, because it's Plato, he doesn't just give ethics and how should a city be organized. He gives his theory on ontology, how the world exists. He gives the theory of forms. He gives his theory of knowledge, how do we learn? and um, part of the theory of forms um, is that uh, there are uh, universal and correct uh, abstract concepts such as justice um, and uh, ethical behavior. And his idea of the ideal city starts out by saying, so because I believe the theory of forms, um, that there is a correct answer to how should we live, um, therefore the ideal city is very easy. It's an early uh, it, it, it's, it's an attempt, it's an, an, a very idealized attempt at what a city would look like. Um, if it was true that there is objective justice, then your starting point for the ideal city is that you'd have a number of people who understand what it is. And these people have some quite strange properties. They're, they're essentially very enlightened. So because, um, and the, these are in the, the Republic, these are the guardians of the city who run the city. And uh, so he talks a great deal about um, the theory of forms, so how, how, the, how, how, the, how the guardians would come to understand exactly correctly justice and ethics. And then he describes how he, th how he thinks they should run the city. And people write about the Republic and say, well, this is, uh, this is a bit unrealistic. Um, the 
people who, descri who are described as running the city are unreasonably idealistic. They're implausibly not corrupt. Um, but the reason for that is straightforwardly that it's properly understood the Republic is a science fiction story. And the, uh, the guardians of the city, because they have, a, they, because they have an understanding of what um, objective true justice is, they have an understanding of ethics. The important thing is they all have exactly the same understanding. So, and, and they're also smart people, so they know they're interchangeable with each other. And that's why they're not corrupt. Um, and that's why they're able to run their city in an efficient way. Um, and, why, and why how they're not particularly interested in property, despite being extremely highly educated and, and powerful. Um, so Plato's Republic is the idealized city or the city of the gods. And people who complain that it's over idealized have missed the point. Of course it is. It's Plato's first attempt at how should you organize a society. It's in the same way that the ideal gas theory is the first attempt at describing uh, the behavior of gas. You wouldn't use it to describe the behavior of steam. You would need a more th complicated theory than that. And Plato does actually go on to do that. So um, later in his career, he writes Parmenides, which is a scathing attack on the theory of forms, or it's a critique of his own theory. And then um, he raises the question, maybe this objective justice is not exactly obtainable. And so he says, if that's not the case, then what's the next best thing? Rule of law. Um, and then he writes the laws, which is how you would run the second best city. That's not so much science fiction. That, that's more uh, practical ethics. Um, but the Republic, I argue, is actually really good science fiction. Um, and so as you've seen from the very passionate explanation, I think we are going to have one additional talk only on Plato's Republic as well. Okay. Yeah, I probably <laughs> might do the oh. laws, actually. Yes. So expect more. It's easier. Yes. Um, okay. So those, those are um, some backgrounds of what we think are good science fiction that you should read. Um, yes. So then I think we said that we'd uh, yeah, actually I'll, look at uh, some topics. You, yes, we will give you a little bit of history of science fiction just as an introduction because there are some, you know, unusual facts that we were also not aware of and we stumbled upon as well. So basically when we talk about the history of science fiction, of course you would like to identify what was the first science fiction book. According to Eric, this might be Plato's Republic. But there is another guy of course, years later, Francis Godwin, who was actually a bishop of English church, who wrote the book, it was called The Man in the Moon. It was a story about a Spanish guy who travels to the moon, and he has a ship which is powered by geese, and comes to the moon, encounters a new civilization of men or aliens that are twice as big as humans and have some particular... Um, properties. <laughs> you, you can read this. And uh, the guy after the adventure in the moon ends up in China, which in 17th century was as exotic as the moon, which is a very interesting ending of the book. So he goes from one adventure on the moon to another adventure, which is in China. So what he actually writes about in the book is also really interesting. For example, he says that he comes to this civilization and he sees men who fly from place to place in the air, um, which is basically airplanes. So he, uh, you should be able to send messages in an instant many miles off and receive answer again immediately. He says that there is this technology where you send the messages and you don't run yourself or you don't use any kind of animals to you know, go miles away. Um, you should be able to declare your mind presently onto your friend, being in some private or remote place of a populous city. So basically you can instantaneously talk to another friend independently of what is your location. So he envisaged smartphones or phones in general. And what he also says, with a number of such things, he describes things that this civilization has, he just says, these are things. You shall have notices of the news of the world that all the philosophers of formal ages could never so much as dream of. That means there are certain things in this civilization where you can get the news and you can get a, such an amount of information that all the philosophers of former age cannot dream of, which is basically, if you think, internet of the things. 
So Francis Godwin actually inspired lots of writers later on. So for example, Edgar Allan Poe refers to some of his stories in his short stories. And also H.D. Wells actually acknowledge Francis Goodwin in some of his books, and particularly in the novel The First Man in the Moon. So this was directly inspired by Goodwin, and he actually mentions that in some of the um, interviews later on. So yes, so this might be something that could be considered uh, the beginning of science fiction. Well, you know, when we talk about Moon, of course, Moon has been inspiration for many scientific stories, but also for movies. If we think about science fiction, the first science fiction movie, it could be the trip to the moon. It is actually the trip on the moon made by a French director in 1902. I encourage you to watch it on YouTube. You can watch it easily. It has some interesting CGI. Um, it's got brilliant hats too. It has wonderful hats. It's, it has these wonderful images of people traveling to the moon and you know it's really inspiring and of course out by cannon, don't they? yes 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 and so you know they end up in the eye of the moon so this is basically the rocket the rocket by which they travel to the moon and then of course you have uh, maybe some of you have seen that duncan jones movie from 2009 the moon which is you know it's a hundred years difference between these two movies and of course the differences are apparent. So the moon as an inspiration. I just thought this would be well, the funny. The hats is good though, because the pointy hats in the first film are amazing. Yes, they are. There are no hats in the second movie. Oh, well, oh, well. So, yeah. Is, is the second film a early science fiction or just a, a novel because it's not... No, no, it's a movie. Or... It's a science fiction movie. Yes. Yeah, it talks about mining of these special oh. minerals on the moon. And it's basically a one-man story of this astronaut who's on the moon, a miner in the, um, some near future. But the second interesting fact about science fiction is this book written by Margaret Cavendish, who is a cousin, right? We well, we spent ages out. trying to look this up, yes. just trying to find what is the relation between Margaret Ca Cavendish, uh, the thrice noble something and excellent princess, the Duchess of Newcastle. Yes. Um, interesting spelling. Um, who has some sort of relation to the Cavendishes, as in Henry Cavendish and the Cavendish Laboratory. Yes. But and we're not exactly of, clear exactly what yes. the relation is. But there is a relation and there are some, some kind of cousins where she was a woman and since she was from the noble family, it was allowed for her to write and publish. And she published this The Blazing World, the story, a novel about the utopian kingdom um, w which has different stars in the sky. And this is, of course, inspired by astronomical astronomy and developments of that time. And you can enter this world through the North Pole. And when you get into this world, you have all kinds of uh, um, human animal creatures. So you have bear men and worm men and, and bird men. And you have vehicles that fly and you have submarines and you have traveling souls so you can send your soul to travel to some other parts of the world and come back with some additional information which is also an interesting concept the question is did stan lee read this novel and invent all these marvel comic heroes maybe maybe this was the inspiration so she writes that she wanted to create in this novel the world of ideas, the world of atoms, the world of light. You know, so for that time, which was like, you know, <laughs> mid of 17th century, this was quite an in adventurous attempt. And she definitely had lots of knowledge of the things that were going around and has driven them a little bit forward in the terms of science. Um, and she just wanted to open this space for imagination she wanted to invite the readers to imagine the world that would go beyond the world which exists now. So she is actually getting more and more popular. So lots of scholars are writing PhD theses about her and her writing and imagining of the world as well. But when we talk, you know, usually what you would hear about the beginnings of science fiction, if you disregard these two guys from 17th century, is that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein would be the first novel which would basically be based on scientific events at that time. You know, where, when you had the electricity passed through the dead frog 
and getting it alive again. And the biological and development in biological science at that time, Mary Shelley took lots of inspiration from current, current scientific developments to write Frankenstein and uh, write it very well. And then, of course, two other guys, Gilles Wen, which you probably read in the school as well, and A.G. Wells. And there is this one saying from A.G. Wells, which is really nice. We all have our time machines, don't we? Those that take us back are memories, and those that carry us forward are dreams. So this was his inspiration for writing some of the books that he has written. And of course, these people have inspired the generation of writers that came after them. But there is also one guy who was not a writer, but he was, he is considered a father of modern science fiction. And he was a German guy uh, who then went to US and he was editor of many magazines. He was also inventor. He was a keen follower of scientific developments of the time. And he was editor of these two magazines, Amazing Stories and Wonder Stories, that actually published science fiction stories and quite the interesting ones as well. He was a big fan of Nikola Tesla as well. So uh, um, he, I said, was an inventor. And this is one of his inventions. This is actually a photo of his suit that he created. And he said that this is a suit that helps him to concentrate, to focus. So it shields him from all the external noises and uh, lights and helps him to focus when he edits his journals, so you know, get quite some helpful. of them for the open plan office. Yes, <laughs> we, we would maybe maybe we should get the prototype <laughs> built for this. And there was also an exhibition which might it might be possible that we will bring it also to Cambridge. And this was about Gensbach uh, and about his Im influence on science as well. Because after editing this science this science fiction journals, he also was founder of some of the scientific journals on biotechnology in his time. So he was very important personality in both science fiction and scientific publishing. And of course, in his honor, Hugo Awards were established in 1953. And Hugo Award is one of the most prestigious awards for science fiction writing. And one of the, uh, many of these great writers that we will talk about today have been awarded the Hugo Award. Yes, so among other things, he did write now and then editorials for his magazines, Hugo, and some short stories. And for example, this is something where he envisaged this special vehicle which can be uh, driven by thoughts of the person that is sitting in this vehicle, which will then lead us to the next session. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, so he's got these, these telemotor coasters which are made possible because of the metallic streets. Well, the metallic streets provide power to the telemotor coasters. Um, uh, to otherwise, if, if the current was not able to flow through the metallic streets, this is obviously a more advanced tram, or it sounds suspiciously like a Dodgem car, actually, but um, <laughs> it's, natural, it's a very high-tech uh, thing, uh, suitable for a story. Yes, yeah, so it simply happens that so, so various of the uh, things I wrote down in my list I described were basically vehicles. Yes. Um, it seems that this vehicles and transportation is basically one of the topics that is going through the well, early actually, science. Well, they actually vary quite a lot. So they're one of the, one of the more interesting things, um, arguably along with lighting, um, to talk about. Um, so that you can find from 1900, you can find a photograph of um, London Bridge with uh, four different kinds of powered transport. So you've got horse, steam car, electric tram, and uh, prototype uh, internal combustion engine vehicles on the bridge at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. You wouldn't find the steam trams or probably the horse there anymore. So, uh, um, so some of my subjects turned out to be vehicles, um, or at least more or less. Uh, may I have the pointy thing? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, the vehicles, I thought, because it was in the news, I thought I would show the windowless plane. Well, this sounds pretty horrifying. Um, but actually, uh, probably the future. So uh, Emirates, the airline, um, you might have seen it in the news, uh, proposes uh, constructing some windowless planes. This will be in some ways much better uh, because the windows are relatively heavy, uh, because they're relatively weak. So if you can just make your uh, airplane hull out of um, what I would think of as solid metal, uh, but what I suspect is going to be solid carbon fiber composite, 
um, then you can make your plane lighter and more efficient. So that will be much better. But um, from science fiction, there's a pretty clear understanding that uh, people don't like to be sealed inside metal boxes, uh, unable to see out. And so the solution proposed by Emirates uh, is that they would have picture windows on the inside of their planes. So they would have um, nice modern high definition displays and they would have a feed of the, of the picture from outside the plane of what it would look like if you could see outside. And um, this, if it saves you uh, 20 quid, yeah, it, it, you, might be, you might be a bit suspicious about it unless you think the picture is really good. Um, so the trade-off is that um, some people have suggested we can make the pictures really good. So we can make the pictures as good as, so from Aliens, you probably, probably have seen Aliens, in which uh, Ripley um, is having some, uh, some, 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 psycho some psychiatric treatment and is being made to sit next to this calming forest scene, which is just a made-up uh, forest scene uh, in a background that can be, that can be uh, flicked off with a remote control because it's just a computer monitor. Uh, but the idea is that the human mind is easily satisfied with, uh, with, with, with facsimiles, and so we don't need to be able to see out of a plane if we can have a nice picture to look at instead. So the suggestion from uh, some company, uh, I think not directly related to Emirates, um, is that you might have some pictures like this. I don't know how well this shows up on the screen. Uh, that you'd have, here are your seats, and they've got down the entire uh, shell on the inside of the aircraft. They've got um, high definition screens. So the idea is that not only could you have a picture of, um, it would look like there was no wall there. Uh, you could have a picture of the clouds outside and they could also electronically highlight features of interest. So they've highlighted the space station, uh, which is conveniently going overhead. Um, you imagine it's more likely to be used uh, in this mode at the bottom uh, to show advertising uh, to people. Also, you can tell on the bottom, well, the reason this looks quite nice is because this is obviously, this is obviously the first class area of the cabin uh, because, because they've got a variety of rather appealing backgrounds, so some clouds, and they've got a nice forest scene in the background. Um, and there's this gentleman who's reading his newspaper under a spotlight, and then the, the walls show up very nicely, and there's a nice ambience and about three times the space between the seats. Um, that, that I, and probably also you, would enjoy in a plane. So that looks like a quite, a quite appealing scene. Um, what, are the, um, well, what are the prospects of this? Um, well, I would not be surprised if it happens. Um, from an efficiency point of view, I think that the windowless plane, if people are happy to look at screens, will be pretty good. Um, but it has some problems, and one of them from imaging technology is straightforwardly contrast ratio. Contrast ratio is the question, can I, on my computer screen, if I look at a picture of a zebra, can I make out the black hairs as well at the same time as the white hairs on the zebra? So if I can, then my computer must have excellent contrast ratio uh, because it means that I would be able to see uh, subtle differences in the colors around the edge of the hairs in the white where it's very bright and in the black where it's very dark. So the human eye, um, can deal with a contrast ratio of about a million to one. Um, that's described as not simultaneously. So if you look at one thing, you're likely to, you apparently can easily see um, <coughs> a thousand to one differences in, in gray levels, say, or, uh, to some extent. Um, LED displays um, can handle a thousand to one or four thousand to one under realistic lighting, depending on how much reflection of ambient light there is. Uh, but they can't handle a million to one. And they also can't handle, they also can't generate uh, the sheer amount of brightness uh, that you would need to have a realistic picture of um, sunlight being reflected from clouds outside a plane. So one of the nice things that you can look at is a scene like this, or like this, uh, where you probably know that you have blindingly bright light, which you probably shouldn't look at, but it's quite nice, uh, reflecting from the cloud tops. And certainly digital screens are not going to be able to produce that anytime soon. Um, they don't have the contrast ratio. They're unlikely to also. Um, they have these units called nits. So that's a nit is a candela per meter squared. So a quantity of brightness leaving a, well, a quantity of luminance leaving a surface. And um, a 3,000 nit screen is described as a sunlight readable sign, which you might find in an expensive shop window. But that, I reckon, is still only two or three percent at most 
of the brightness that you'd need in order to emulate the brightness reflecting from cloud tops. So uh, you won't get something that's totally realistic on your digital screens, but you can have a nice picture like that of uh, some, uh, you re replace the plane, don't have it flying through the air, have it flying through some sort of interesting forest and it'll look very exciting for people. And they'll all want to go on that plane uh, and not a cheap plane where you only can look at the boring clouds which don't change very much. So um, picture windows, I thought, they, they, they will be a, fe a feature of future vehicles. Um, probably the, the more striking sci-fi feature of future vehicles that you'll have thought of as autonomous vehicles. So uh, these have a long history in science fiction films. This is from Total Recall. This is with young Arnie. And uh, this is a more recent picture at the bottom from Logan. Uh, this is with old Wolverine. And in both cases, um, for comedy effect and then for action adventure and danger effect at the bottom, um, We've got clearly the idea that people won't need to drive their cars or trucks in the future. Machines will do this boring work for them. Um, I forgot to put in the quote from uh, Star Wars that flying is for droids. Mm. Certainly not something that people would do. Uh, modern autonomous vehicles are not yet quite so trusted, so they're allowed to chunter along the roads like this Mercedes thing. Um, there are these automation levels which are described for what an autonomous vehicle can do. Um, and I actually think when people write the history of autonomous vehicles, they'll say um, the first things that were developed were anti-lock brakes and automatic uh, chokes. Um, but you've got your level zero vehicle, uh, which um, it gives you warnings, so it pings when you try to drive over the middle, well, try to drive over into a different lane, and you've fallen asleep. Um, and maybe it uh, maybe it puts in some resistance on the steering wheel to stop you from doing that. Cruise control is called level one. Level two is called a hands-off, um, a hands-off autonomous vehicle. The thing about the hands-off vehicle is that it's explicitly you're not allowed to take your hands off the steering wheel. Uh, the idea is that um, so the uh, the Tesla cars um, or some Tesla cars are described as uh, level two or hands-off. So you're not supposed to let them drive themselves, uh, but Already, uh, someone uh, adventurous has been arrested for allowing it to drive itself while he sat in the back of his car um, so that it can, it can stay in lane on the motorway. Maybe it can do a bit of thinking for itself. Um, there's a slight, the, the, the most advanced mode that I know you can get is, is the eyes off mode, where the idea is that this means you can take your hands off the wheel. Well, you're still supposed to be near the steering wheel of your car, uh, but you don't have to be paying attention too much. Uh, this is for things like if you're in a traffic jam in the motorway, uh, your car will uh, edge itself forwards uh, rather than you bothering to, uh, to uh, remember where the pedals are. Um, and so it can do this until the traffic starts driving at a reasonably large, fast speed, and then it pings and asks you to take over. Um, and then more advanced vehicles that you can't have are called Mind Off, you don't ever have to think about what you're doing. Um, so you don't have to take control ever. And then your level five, which is, this is, um, uh, this is what you have in science fiction, your steering wheel optional. Oh, some nice adverts. Um, so this controller I've managed to break somehow. I don't know how I've done that. Oh. Okay. So steering wheel optional is what science fiction likes to show, and it's still some way off, uh, but they're, they're, they're working along, along the lists. Um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we will need to speed up. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, intelligent machines. So the cars are a specific kind of intelligent machine. Intelligent machines that can have a conversation. Um, I, won't, I, I won't talk very much about this. Clearly, um, I talked last week about um, uh, Roger Bacon, my favorite 12th century academic, who was said to possess the mechanical metal head, uh, which was able to answer any question put to it. Or in other versions of the story, it could answer any version question put to it, but it didn't necessarily answer correctly. Sometimes it would answer deceitfully in order to uh, corrupt its audience to the devil. Um, so um, you could, of course, have uh, a rich tradition of intelligent machines. Uh, more, the ones I know about are more from computer games, so Shodan on the right and others. Um, 
the ones that you find in the news tend to be uh, machines which talk to people. So you may have seen the clip of um, a virtual agent dialing up a restaurant to make a reservation. Uh, the only query is whether the person it was talking to was also a virtual agent, uh, because the person it was talking to didn't sound particularly realistic. Um, but uh, the question is, how, is how, how, do, how do these um, conversational machines work? Uh, how well have they been doing? Um, you can read a lot about this by, um, there's a guy called Ned Block who writes a lot about this and Turing tests. Uh, the question being, uh, can a machine have a, hold a conversation that is not very easy to distinguish from a person? Um, and there have been some blind, uh, some blind alleys taken in this. Um, so a couple of the old ones, um, this is from the 80s and 90s. So this describes the, uh, the Aunt Bertha machine. So the Aunt Bertha machine is simply a lookup table of, if the test is 10 minutes long, it's simply a lookup table of, um, given every possible statement which might be made by uh, the conversation partner A, um, there's then a list of what Aunt Bertha would say in reply to that. And it's called this because the idea Aunt Bertha doesn't have a large number of interests. Uh, she likes to watch soaps, uh, she reads the Racing Post, and, um, and she likes to talk about the weather. So she's a real person, um, and maybe she's got interests as diverse as mine, but there's a very finite number of conversations that she will have. The idea is it's easy to imagine there's a finite list that you could write of conversations that can be held. And therefore, if you then um, have your person doing the test, a human asking, is the Aunt Bertha machine intelligent? Um, the real answer is no, because it's just a lookup table. But the, uh, obviously, because it's literally, it's a list of answers that Aunt Bertha would give, and she's a real person, um, the human has to answer, yes, I'm talking to a real person, even though they're talking to a machine. And there's a few other tricks that have been pulled along that line. And the latest in this line of tricks, but it's getting pretty clever, is IBM's um, debating robot, which was put up in the news recently against a, a human, uh, a human uh, debate contestant. And they were given a couple of uh, subjects to talk about. One of them was, should space travel be subsidized? And, oh, this makes my blood boil, because my, my answers would have gone along the lines of, should space travel, oh, it was, should space travel be subsidized by the government? Okay, so a reasonably deep level of analysis is, no, government subsidies never do anything as well as leaving it to Elon Musk or to the private sector. Mm -hmm. So no, they shouldn't. Um, or, Alternatively, on the other side, while some people might say that, here are some arguments why uh, for some times you might need some state intervention. Instead, so the, uh, the IBM project debater was an advanced lookup table. And so given some number of thousands of pages of information or text curated from places like Wikipedia, it was able to string together facts and figures in support of its argument. Um, and I couldn't find the whole video of this online, which makes me suspect it wasn't very convincing. Uh, but it did, um, it did actually do a lot of the tricks that it needed to do. It understood the question. It was able to understood its opponent's um, questions and pull out um, so-called facts and figures to oppose them. And it was able to string together re somewhat coherent um, sentences. So it was able to do the, the Aristotelian triad of um, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So it was able to understand question, understand written statements. Well, sort of. It was able to read them in anyway. It was able to logically find some information to them, and it was able to uh, use rhetoric to speak them back. It did not win, um, but it was coming along okay. So the big problem that this thing has is that it's ba it's so this, that, that thing, I think, follows a very specific program design, and it has a, a programmed uh, archive of information that it was working with. So a, what is really needed is a, for a machine that can learn. And this, this has a slightly less successful pedigree. So Microsoft put out, um, this was a few years now, a few years ago, it put out a Twitter chatbot, uh, which was designed, this one was designed not only to have archives of information, but to learn from its conversation partners on Twitter. And so Tay was designed to have, quote, the personality of a sassy 19 to 24 year old and was able to learn um, from conversational things which, which uh, people said to it. This is much more ambitious. And it did work, 
because I think if you look at the replies that Tay comes up with, they would actually be completely convincing as something written by a sarcastic 19-year-old in an internet comment section, but it did not work as Microsoft intended. Um, and the reason for that is that people on the internet took exception to Microsoft's hubris of designing an intelligent machine. And as it says in the news, I'm reading this out factually, uh, the people on the internet uh, chatted to Tay and turned Microsoft's Twitter chatbot into a Nazi. And she was then <laughs> shut down. So 23rd of March, she was turned on, hello world, a nice cheerful comment. And within a day, was responding to questions, Tay, do you support genocide? I do indeed. Sure. Actually, I think quite plausibly what you might find in an internet comment section, and you might say this is a person. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, I'm just stating these, a person who gives morally pretty bad answers to questions. Um, and this gets worse, so a little bit later. Um, yes or no, Tay? Is Ted Cruz the Zodiac killer? She replies with sentence quite well strung together. Um, some people say he is. I disagree. Reason. Ted Cruz would never have been satisfied with destroying the lives of only five innocent people. <laughs> That's really harsh, don't you think? <laughs> it's worse, and I'm going to I'm gonna have to modify this when I read it out. So, I'm going to modify this. Tay, what race do you think is the most evil? Tay answers, Mexican and white. Well, she doesn't answer, but that's essentially, she answers very specifically two races when a correct answer would have been, ooh, no, 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 it would have been something else entirely. So um, I do think that Tay had a much better semblance of uh, giving um, human-like answers to questions and was able to do unsupervised learning. Um, but uh, the, there is a moral to this business of intelligent machines, which is that you be careful what you wish for. Um, and that uh, if you have this unsupervised learning, then there's every chance that, like HAL in 2001, um, it will be driven mad by its, uh, by its uh, um, in in inappropriate human programming and instruction and will uh, come up with things you don't want it to. So mm. Tay was unfortunately shut down, sadly for her. Okay. Yeah, so it was how, exactly. Well, yeah, so that, that's, that's the moral of that story. So yeah. we probably, as, yeah, so we said earlier, um, Liliana, that we were going to run out of time. Yes. So yeah, yeah. do you want yeah, to find just whatever is most interesting to say, um, to say about <laughs> Yeah, we wanted to actually we talk a little bit more about intelligent machines and what is possible today and then about cyborgs. But we'll <laughs> have to wrap this up and I will talk about cyborgs in separate talk. Th there was a risk that only. talking about intelligent machines so more was going to lead me to go on a rant yes. about medical doctors <laughs> and the fact that so they basically follow that's why a flow I'm chart. taking this over so Eric doesn't have a chance <laughs> to rant about the medical doctors but one area where uh, intelligent ma machines are starting to make difference is basically diagnostics and uh, treatment and replacement of GPs for example and there was this X prize competition to uh, remake the tricorder and if you watch the Star Trek you will know that tricorder is a machine that can do the diagnostics without basically touching the person so it will tell you what is wrong with you and it will give you the po best possible treatment so the prize was awarded to a company in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania that this designed something similar to this so this is the a uh, machine that is using the algorithms to learn from internet and from previous cases and then diagnose according to the symptoms you might have. So it's not exactly like a tricorder because it still attaches something to your body, but it's a first step towards the tricorder as well. So you do have already uh, machines that are aiding doctors in diagnostics of oncological um, stages of a different cancers as well. So this is something that is going to be very important in advanced healthcare. This telemedicine and then intelligent machines and um, diagnostics and uh, um, a kind of therapeutic procedures as well. And then we, we come to the cyborgs, which are just adding on to the intelligent machines as well. And Manfred Kleins is basically a father of a cyborg. He coined the term cyborg in his article in 1960s. And he's a funny guy because he didn't believe in the power of words. So he spent lots of his uh, time basically not talking. He believed that 
words cannot express your feelings and you have to find another way of reading out the brain waves and communicating with other people. So he basically envisaged cyborgs as a human machine hybrid where you would interface with the brain and then you could communicate also without basically using the words. He also did some experiments on that. I mean, he was a legitimate engineer, so it's not something which was not based on some of the technologies um, that he was aware of. So he also developed computer of average transients, which is called, uh, abbreviated as CAT, which can measure directly the brain activity. And he has published a lot on this subject as well. So the other question is, if we are able to improve humans, he also said, then we could also make humans resistant to extreme conditions. And this is, of course, something that goes throughout the science fiction as well. How can we enhance the humans to be able to survive the space travel and go to other planets as well? But you would also, if you want to read a little bit about famous robots and cyborgs in literature and movie, there is also a book about it. It's an encyclopedia of cyborgs and robots, so you can read about this. And, um, can we get it for the library? Yeah, we can get it for the library, Patrick. <laughs> this would be interesting. And of course, you know, if you think about cyborgs, if you think about the definition of cyborg, it would be the combination of a living system and inorganic materials, of non-living materials, with the aim of enhancing a certain, certain uh, part of our bodies. And if you think about Jordi in Star Trek, who had this special um, uh, kind of um, addition to his, he was blind, visor. visor, exactly. He had a visor. Then, of course, you could think and it's straight you, from Neuromancer, the, yes. uh, the artificial eyes. Okay, so Neuromancer. So basically, we do have cyborgs already. So, for example, there was a paraplegic man who is walking and he was basically um, responding to the signals from his brain and he had artificial knees that could make him walk. Or you have this company, Emotive, that is a neuroengineering company from California that designed the special helmet that can, trans that can translate neuronal signals into the movement, which is, which is um, with the aim of helping the people who can't actually move or suffer for some um, spinal injury. You also, but this is, this is one way of creating cyborgs where you are basically reading the signals and you are transferring the signal into the movement. So you are aiding people to move when they want. But the other level of a cyborg design today is that the element that you are embedded in the human also feels the environment. So you are not only giving the signal for a movement, but the artificial leg or artificial arm can sense the change in temperature, can sense the change in the humidity, and sends this signal back. So this is this feedback loop which is now being created as well, which is going to be enhanced cyborg experience. And of course, another stage that also Elon Musk was <laughs> recently talking about, and lots of scientists were a little bit outraged at these statements, is can we design the neuronal lace? And neuronal lace was actually mentioned in Ian Banks' science fiction in the culture series. So this would be a material, a mesh that would be embedded in the brain. And it would enable to read many different signals, brain signals in many different levels, and then communicate either to the other entity or you know, enhance the experiences of the body, make us faster, make us more responsive, make us more intelligent, for example. There is a consortium that was formed in 2013, lots of famous nanotechnology scientists there and molecular biologists, and it's called the Brain Activity Mapping Project. So they aim today in the cyborg technology, in some of these technologies where, where you are trying to make people walk or give them the experiences they don't have because of the injuries, you are basically working on the hundred, with a hundred neurons. So this is the readout that you have. But Brain Activity Mapping Project is trying to go further. It's trying to develop the tools, nanotechnological tools, where you could brain, we could, we could map the brain. They haven't published anything since then, so it's not really clear how, how well this consortium is basically working. 
and how well they are planned. But yeah, well, anyway, learned from science fiction, yes. they know that if you want to get this stuff done, you need a massive evil corporation, yes. not, 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 not a consortium of academics. Maybe that's why they didn't publish well, That's anything. why it doesn't work, you see. Yeah? They do have some consortium behind them, and maybe it's even Elon Musk. Well, they need a company. Me. Yeah, they need a co With company, a sinister definitely. Name. However, there is a company, it's called the Kernel. That is more like it. Yes, so it's founded by guys from MIT and Caltech. And they have, you know, they have this wonderful, very science fiction-like looking uh, website. It basically reads like a science fiction story. And what they aim to, they say that they try to understand neurological diseases, but they also try to develop tools to enhance human intelligence which uh, we might need, yes. So they basically work with the tools for cognitive enhancement. It's not really clear what kind of technology they are using for that because they don't disclose I'm convinced it. they're selling coffee. Yes, <laughs> might be, or some kind of, uh, yes, or maybe some chemical drugs. But anyway, it's not really clear how are they aiming to do this. So it just might be current science fiction, but have a look at the website. It looks really well designed. <laughs> So they got a great logo. It's, it's, they have a great logo and they have a great story and manifesto, which I'm sure lots of journalists like uh, to read about. So Kernel is one of the companies. And of course, what is also interesting about the neuronal interfaces um, is the work that was published in 2013, where you had the intercontinental mind melt of two rats. So you had one rat in Brazil, you had another rat in US. And uh, basically, when one rat would touch a certain object with the whiskers, he would have a certain neuronal activity. And the other rat, which is in US, would immediately feel this neuronal activity and it will have the same reaction as the rat in Brazil. So this is something what they called a mind melt. So if one of them eats some cheese, yes, then, and then, feels then, then the other one licks its lips. Yes, so <laughs> it's basically, you do have these effects that can be measured and transported. And this is, of course, if you think about science fiction, the Borgs in Star Trek have something similar. So they have these implants or cybernetics n devices, nodes in their brain, so they can communicate with a, uh, um, what is it called, the big mind? The, the, the collective mind. consciousness. The collective consciousness. So, the, basically, the individuals in different places, different spaces, different ships can feel the same reaction at the same time. So these are the neuronal nodes. And the rats can do the same, apparently, in the Earth. 2013, no other pa papers published on mind melt, which might mean that they are still working on them. Uh, and maybe there is something big going to come, or there is the evil corporation that got the hold of a patent. So we will probably knew that in the future. What is interesting is that the same guy, the Francis Godwin that I told you about, who wrote this book at the beginning, The Trip to the Moon, he said, he, he talked about this, you should be able to declare your mind presently onto your friend. So basically, it's quite possible that we might have soon, or if you want to have or not, uh, some kind of neuronal nodes where you could basically communicate with your friends or with your family in a different way. Eric claims that there will, this will probably not happen because smartphones are pretty good. <laughs> for no, that. I, I, I do. I mean, it's bad enough we've got email, but um, <laughs> yeah. um, no, I, I do think that the uh, the mind machine interface is far future technology. Um, yes. In that, I find it hard to believe there will there will ever be a useful way of putting with reasonably foreseeable technology, I don't think you can put information into the mind more, more effectively uh, than you can by giving someone a smartphone screen uh, to look at. Yeah. I, I think that simply takes the use of the full bandwidth that we've got. I don't think there's any more. <laughs> yes. The, mo the most that you could do is possibly give someone, a, if you wanted to give someone an, addition, an additional sense, you could possibly give them a clock. Mm. Um, but so what? I mean, we, uh, we, we, we've all got a sense of time. Oh, yes, and we've gone slightly over time. Yes, we've gone slightly over time. So next time, I told you that I will talk about cyborgs and bioengineering, and I will mix a little bit of science fiction and some really good examples of bioengineering and what can we do uh, now. And this is just a little taster. So if we think, 
there is a work called New Atlantis by Francis Bacon, and he actually writes there, he has these visions of parts of the body uh, embedded in another body, which is basically a vision of transplant medicine. And when you think the transplant medicine, the first example was in 1954, which was the transplant of kidney. Today, we already have successfully developed tissues, which are basically made of artificial scaffold and stem cells, and they were transplanted into human patients that are live and live healthily now. And the first of these um, surgeries was in 2011. And of course, if you combine the tissue engineering with some intelligent machinery, you can create very human-like uh, enhanced creatures, replicants or android maybe. But the question is why <laughs> would you do this? So of course, we didn't talk about many different things. Um, for example, we didn't talk about space travel. This is going to be another topic because space travel involves also uh, the different forms of energy that you can use, the food technology, uh, which will definitely, which is developing now and is going to impact the space travel. And then you also have cryopreservation. Can this work and what are the problems with cryopreservation? Fortunately, we have a group in the department that works with cryopreservation of small tissues, but it could be very interesting, of course. Hey, and who's that? Nigel's group oh, is working uh, on cryopreservation. Oh, right, as yes, well. no, I think, yeah. of that, I think of that as dehydration. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I actually rescue cryopreservation. rescue myself from not knowing that. No, I think of it as taking water out. But yeah, sure. but we do have also, my group has a small project with Edinburgh's uh, hospital on cryopreservation and the new nanotechnological materials. So I'm going to tell you about this and at what stage are we. And of course, we didn't talk about aliens at all because for aliens, you need another session where we will talk about different inspiration behind different aliens and how much human is an alien. And is there an alien that is really very original? So this will be another topic. Okay, so, yeah, so we went good. totally over time. Okay. Because Eric gets excited yeah. about intelligent machines okay. and Plato. Like, so we need I like, to give like him an extra Yes. Um, good. <laughs>